Christopher, I want to ask you about, all, well, partly in connection with all these objects around here, why the Chinese emperor was so obsessed with what was going on in the heavens? Why was it so important to him? For the Chinese emperors, the sky was a great array of indicator lights and warning signals. So it was essential that he should have a staff of people to keep watch on them night after night and to record what they saw so you could tell whether or not the cosmos was showing any signs of disorder. Because any signs of disorder in the natural world, and particularly in the heavens, meant that something was going wrong on Earth. In other words, the emperor's government was not being carried out properly. There was also another aspect of it, that when the indicator lights began flashing or being in the wrong place up there, that might be a warning that something unusual was going to happen within the human world, like you know, a treasonous plot, a rebellion, for instance, or some, some other disaster. Um, but basically, the emperor had to keep his eye on the control instruments up there, on the warning lights, and that's why he needed his staff of astronomers. And that's why we have such a long tradition of carefully taken astronomical records stretching back in China for 2,000 years or more. Okay. So now, as, as well as measuring what's going on up in the heaven, it was also measuring, in, in some way, time, wasn't it? Over seconds, months, years. Could you talk about the relationship between astronomy and time and what time, what the function of time? Yes, indeed. Let me just collect thoughts and yeah. one to link with the other. I'll think so. One principal function of the activity of China's official astronomers has been to tell people how to divide up time, how from moment to moment the situation of the cosmos is changing in ways which affect the whole of human life which might say everything from, say, precisely when the emperor should conduct the ritual at the moment of the winter solstice, all the way down to when an ordinary person should have their hair cut. And the emperor expresses this by every year issuing a great astronomical almanac, which has in it all the things we would expect from an almanac, like the, the equivalent of days of the week and days of the month and so on, but much more besides, including data on the movement of the planets, uh, data when there are favourable times and unfavourable times for all sorts of things. And of course these almanacs are still purchased by many Chinese people every Chinese New Year. But in former times they were the prerogative of the emperor. And indeed, where you to actually issue your own almanac uh, based on your own calculations, that in itself might have constituted a treasonous act. Okay, now let me ask you about you know, the mechanical measurement of time, something that was um, pioneered in Europe, you might argue, but also happened to some extent in a, in a slightly different way in China. Could you talk about that? Before the coming of the Western-style mechanical clock governed by springs or pendula, time measurement in China proceeded by various means. One of the most important, however, was the clock based on the flow of water, the clepsydra, and these were developed to a very high degree. Um, simple outflow clepsydra could be modified so that through all kinds of compensating arrangements the flow of water was very steady and so they were quite accurate. But at their most exciting, you found that the flow of water was used to govern the movement of great mechanical devices that would indicate the passage of the hours and the movement of the heavens, such as that, for instance, uh, built by, uh, under the direction of the official Susung in the 11th century. Um, this had all kinds of devices on it to announce what was going on, because in some ways it was a mechanized version of the great drum and bell tower, which we still see in Beijing today, which announced the passage of the night watches to the people. Well, tell me what was so special and extraordinary about Susung's clock. I think that the most striking thing about Su Sun's clock is that it takes a tradition in China of making this kind of device, of making automatically moving devices that, that mimic the heavens, and I think does with it as much as you could possibly expect from a pre-modern technology based on the flow of water. There are extremely cunning arrangements to ensure that the great wheel moves round 
at exactly equal intervals. There are arrangements, for instance, by which the flow of water from constant head tanks is measured in little weighing machines that, when they reach the right level, trip the wheel to go around precisely another step. And to that great wheel, there's linked an armillary sphere, for instance, which obviously shows you how the heavens are moving, as well as figures and bells and drums that show you how the hours are passing and how the celestial bodies are moving. So I think it really is the, the, the absolute apogee of the traditional Chinese time-measuring art. And in many ways, many of its features are uh, well in advance of anything that was known in Europe by way of timekeeping mechanisms by some centuries. Ah, Mama, Li Jiaxiao, please introduce this instrument. Okay, what do you need? Ah, okay. This instrument is called the Jiheng Fuchen Yi. The Jiheng Fuchen Yi is the last instrument of the Qing Dynasty. Ah? The Jiheng Fuchen Yi was invented in 1744. Ah, okay. Until 1744- Can you use this instrument? Yes, yes. 这个仪器还是相当重要，是这个我们清朝的最后一架仪器。这架仪器，而且。